How y'all doing? Happy Father's Day again to the fathers. I'm going to get because I don't want to keep you. I know y'all have things to do afterwards. I, I'm going to get going. And uh, I want to put a disclaimer. Just a little bitty disclaimer. I done went old school today. I don't have no slides. I got paperwork. I normally have an iPad. So for our visitors that don't know me, my name is Pastor Derek Washington. And we thank you so much for being with us today. So we appreciate it. And those of you that know me, y'all know I get loud, a little bit loud. I don't mean to. So I'm not hollering at nobody. I just want y'all to know, not hollering. Guess I'm not hollering at you. But I do want to put an itty-bitty disclaimer up front. The Holy Spirit just asked me to put a little bit of a disclaimer up front. Um, I'm going to talk about some things that, I don't know, might get uncomfortable. Um, might make you move in your seat a little bit. Um, uh, being an African-American male and a father, I'm going to talk about some things directly to African-American men. That doesn't exclude my white brothers or brown brothers at all. But I want to talk to you directly and I want to talk to you honestly. And I want to talk to you with what God talked to me about in my walk of being a father of being a son. So I want to make sure that I take uh, care of that. I'm going to be coming out of Genesis chapter 26, and it's going to be verses 12 through 22 is what I'm going to cover. But what I would like to do before I get there, I want you guys to turn there. I have some scriptures that I want to put forth into your hearing from a father to a son uh, and from the father to his servants to kind of set the stage on where we're headed today. And I won't, I'll try not to be before you long, but as Pastor Steve told me, it's already been said in heaven, so all I'm doing is being the conduit this morning. Amen. So you don't have to turn here, but let me just read three, three of these uh, scriptures to kind of set the stage for what I want to talk about today. First Kings 2, 2 through 3 reads this way. And this is David talking to his son, Solomon. I am about to go the way of all the earth, he said. So be strong, act like a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commandments, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go. 1 Kings 3.14 And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you long life. That's God talking to Solomon. And then this last one. I want to read Proverbs 13.22, just the A part of the scripture. A good man, and I put in parentheses, a good father will leave an inheritance to his children's children. To his children's children. And there is a, a speaker that I had an opportunity to meet when I was uh, in high school going through a program called Inroads where we had an opportunity to uh, internship with the company that we would end, of, end up possibly working for when we graduated from college. And he came in and he's, he's like the father of network networking is who George C. Frazier is. And George C. Frazier said um, while he was on a plane going to wherever he was going to speak, that he read in the USA Today, uh, obviously everybody knows that magazine, and it said that we have on the verge, we have about 77 million baby boomers. Now baby boomers are the ages, the year born between 1946 and 1964. And out of those 77 million baby boomers, there's about approximately 9 million African-American baby boomers. 
And the article read, this will be the first year in our history that a generation raises another generation that will be worse off than themselves. And when I began to take that in, that in 400 years, this will be the first generation that will raise another generation that will be worse off than them. I have to come to my house today. I have to come to my father's today. And I have to say, what's going on? And what are we doing about it? Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord God. Work through me however you need to be and need to do today, Lord God. Move me out of your way because I have nothing to say but what you've downloaded into me today, Lord God. So I want to say thank you, Lord God, because we honor you on this Father's Day as we do every day. And we honor these men as fathers in this house. But Lord God, challenge us today and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to speak to you on the title, What Will Your Legacy Be? What will you leave behind for your sons and your grandsons and your daughters and your granddaughters? And my big idea throughout this is simply obedience is greater than sacrifice. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. So as we are in Genesis chapter 26, I'm going to abstract and give you a little bit of historical context. I want to talk about Isaac today, the son of Abraham. We don't see him much through scripture. They talk a lot about Abraham because he was the father and he was the beginning. They talk about a lot about the son Jacob because of all his exploits and what he did. But we don't always see and talk about Isaac. Isaac, the one that Abraham had to tie up and go to a land called Moriah and take his son up on a hill and put him on an altar because God said, I want you to sacrifice him because I want to see where your obedience is, where your allegiance is. And right before he was about to sacrifice him, God said, hold on, but are you good? You good. I know you're going to do exactly what I say. And I'm going to tell you today that obedience is the key to us delivering something good in this earth. If we would choose to just follow what God is telling us and not what the world and what we feel like we have to do with the world. In this chapter, God is talking about when we read verse one and I'm going to get to verse 12 and just kind of give you some background. There was a great famine going on in the land. It was just like the one Abraham went through. But in Abraham's case, God said to him, I want you to leave everything. I want you to leave your father's house. I want you to leave your land, your people. I want you to go somewhere that I can get you by yourself so you can hear me. But he told the son something totally different. He told the son, I want you to stay right here in the midst of this famine because I'm going to show you exactly what I want you to do and I'm going to bless you regardless of what's going on around you. And I want you to stay right there. Then it said God appears to him. And this is one area that I've had trouble with in my life. In my life. I've been going through weight issues my entire life after I got through playing sports. And I've been up and down and up and down throughout my life. And I finally, Lord, in this message, the Lord finally showed me why I keep going up and down and up and down. Because I live a life of sacrifice and not obedience. See, what my life is, is that what I do, 
I can go on. I done been on about 15,000 different diets. I don't eat until sun down. On some of my diets, I did the Daniels. I did, I did everyone that you can think of. Meat only, no sugar, no bread. And I will lose that weight. Right now, today, I got a banner in my office because in three months, I lost the most weight. But I should have a banner right next to it because I gained it all back and more. This is the heaviest I've been in my life. And it's because... I only deal with sacrifices because as soon as my fast finishes, I'm the first one to Golden Corral. I didn't put on, I, didn't, I got steak. I didn't got, I didn't went to the, the dessert bar line two or three times right after I finish. Right after I finish fasting. Because there has been no change on the inside. Sacrifice makes you look on the outside and make you do things on the outside. But when you begin to walk in obedience like I'm going to, and you begin to deal with the inside, and you begin to do life changes in your life, and you begin to eat right, and you begin to put it down because you know somebody else is speaking to you about being obedient to his word. I won't have to worry about this. And I promise you, I promise you, give me 365 days. I will not talk about this anymore because I'm tired. I'm tired. And somebody says tolerance when you tolerate things, they'll never change. If you live a life of toleration, you will never change. So I can cry, I can go to the doctor and say I wanna be here for my children, I can do all of that which I've done. But I wasn't willing to change the inside. And that's gotta change for all of us as Christians. I also want to speak to dads as well, because in getting to verse 12, you will see that Abraham or Isaac does and repeats exactly what his father does. He go into the town talking about my wife is my sister because he's fearful and fear will make you do crazy things. When you're fearful. Now, mind you, God just told him, I'm going to bless you. But see, it's hard for us to hear God when we're not doing and being and acting in obedience. And I've done it in my life. What I've done in my life when, when, when I think I'm hearing God, what I end up doing is I ask God to join me in my work. And not to join him in his work. See, because if I begin to join him in his work, it becomes, to, it, it begins to be uncomfortable. And God, whether you know it or not, God wants us to live an uncomfortable life. So we have to be comfortable in our uncomfort. So he can use you because when we begin to be comfortable, you sit in your pew month after month, week after week, and you come get a word. And you sing a song. And you go back the same way, and then you come back again next week. That's comfortable. And we never impact the city. Never. Again, I'm not hollering at y'all. I'm hollering at me. Because I'm not exempt from doing the same exact thing. Genesis 26 reads this way. Y'all, I had to get a bigger Bible, and I'm still struggling. Amen. So let me just bring it up to my face. I tried to wear my, uh, my, my contacts. It says in verse 12, Isaac planted crops in the land. And in the same year, he reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. 
the man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. That's interesting as we look at as we look at this because there was a famine in the land. One thing that we do, I have done, is that if I've lost a job or if I got laid off in tough times, I stop sowing. I stop sowing into whatever it is, whether it's tithing or giving because I get into my own feelings. And what I would tell you is it's a principle. Because what it communicates to God, if you continue to sow in times that are tough, like famines, it communicates to him that you know who your Jehovah Jireh is. You know who your provider is. Was it the job? Is that what you're going to put your hopes and dreams into? That job and so we get crazy when things happen or do we put our hopes on high? It's a question that we have to answer individually. I struggled with it in my lifetime. I'm not going to lie. I've been laid off. I've been fired from a job. And then the first thing I do is I try to hold back my tithe check. And I hold back giving, communicating to God, I don't think you got me. And so I think we have to be, we have to really understand that. But Isaac, in the same year, received a hundredfold blessing. And what that will end up doing to people is make them jealous of you. Because now you will be showing the heart of God as you walk through a famine situation in your life. And you continue to be the person God has called you to be. Men, we got to model stuff for our sons, ladies. We got to model stuff for our daughters and vice versa. And if we can't show in the hard times, this life is going to be ups and downs all the way through. And if we break down and panic in the hard times, we will communicate to the next generation, that's how you should act. He had become so wealthy, Isaac had become so wealthy and powerful. The king came over to his place and said, man, you got to go. You become too powerful. When things Y'all, y'all hear me on this. When things are going good in your life, don't sometimes things just come and take you all out of whack. Come in, you, you know, something, somebody didn't went through something and you got to go deal with it and life becomes harder just when you think you're doing well. A lot of the times we think that's the devil throwing us off key and we want to blame it on somebody. I come here today to tell you, I think God told King Abimelech, come move him because I want him to go higher. So I disrupt what he's doing, his hundredfold uh, harvest, and I move him to another place that I want him to go to so he don't get too comfortable. And what I would tell you is this, as a Christian man, as a Christian woman, always leave the place that you leave better than it was when you got there. See, when they made him leave, I believe the land was still fertile. And God said, I'm going to bless your descendants and everybody that comes into contact with you. Because that's how I do it. And so I believe those Philistines went on over there and they got to benefit from what Isaac had to leave. So that communicates to me as a Christian, we need to be able to leave the places better than how we found them. 
when we do that. Genesis, uh, let's read 17. I might have to take these things off, y'all. Because now I can't read. I need to, where's she at with the magnifier? Is that the big one? Oh, Lord, have mercy. Thank you so much. <laughs> Amen. Woo, I can read that from across the aisle over there. Amen. Thank you. See? You took care of it. That's why we family. Amen. And I can read this clear as day. Amen. So Isaac departed from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham, his father, which the Philistines had stopped after the death, stopped up after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the names that his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there was a well, a well of spring water, the herdsmen in Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, the water is ours. They, 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 they didn't got the mineral rights on the land. You hear what I'm saying? He didn't went to a new land. He didn't put in the effort. He didn't redug one of the wells that Abraham left. They found some spring water. And then the herdsmen of that land came to him and said, this is our water. And started quarreling, uh, quarreling with him. Sometimes people are going to try to take credit for work that you do. And you're going to get upset about it. But it seems like here, Isaac probably did get upset. The Bible doesn't speak to it. What the Bible says is he moved to the next well. And then the same thing began to happen. And he called that well shit new. I wasn't cussing. <laughs> sit new. Maybe it was sit new, and we'll leave it at that. <laughs> but that's opposition. And he gave it out. And he went and he dug and they came and they told him, hey, we don't want you to do it here. So when I begin to think about this, God is communicating obedience to us because he will fight our battles if we let him. See, this is what I want you to do. Sometimes somebody throws some dirt on you. I just want you to shake it off. And when you shake it off, I want you to stomp on it. See, when people begin to talk about you, when people begin to throw dirt on you, all I want you to do is shake it off. Step on it and go a little bit higher. See, every time they say something about you, don't go back and say nothing about them. Shake it off. Step on it and get a little bit higher. Every time they do it, See, they can talk about me. They can talk out, call me out my name. They can do all of that. And all you do is shake it off. Step up. Because he wants to promote you in what you're doing. But this is what we do. We arguing. We fussing and fighting. They call us names. We call it back. Here we go. Acting like the world, doing exactly what the world says. They trying to fire us. We going to sue the big billion dollar corporation. Get us all out of our peace. Now you're not obey obeying no more. You're demoting. You're going down. You're delaying your blessings. Because we won't let God fight our battles for us. We stay fighting them. And we do what the world has done over and over again. And God does not honor that. He don't compromise. He wants you to be obedient. He will give you long life. He will take care of your children's children when you're obedient. Then let me put a pin right there for a moment and I won't be before you long 
I'm going to talk to all men, but because I'm an African-American man, I'm going to talk about that too. And this goes to legacy. Black boys in this country need black men role models. They're out in the streets with no direction a lot of the times. And we can't find a black man in sight that wants to take time with them. Nothing to my white brothers because what the article that I read said is that we have more white men mentoring our young black children than we have black men. That's not an indictment on white men. That's an indictment on black men. We have somebody in our families that we can go grab and get a hold of and begin to mentor them, mentor them through their high school years. And God has asked me to call that out. Men, it can't just be about me and mine. That's not kingdom principles. That's United States principle. Raise yourself up by your bootstraps and do it all on your own. That's not kingdom. It's giving somebody a helping hand up so that they can survive and succeed in this world. Literacy rates. Got a got a got a got an article. I should have brought it, but I went old school today. No slides. But I'm gonna go off my memory. Fifty percent of black boys and girls are not at fourth grade reading level. Forty-seven percent of our brown brothers and sisters are not at fourth grade reading levels. 67% of the population that is not able to read at a fourth grade level are destined for jail and for welfare. And I found out Aurora, Colorado is one of the top three cities of illiteracy in the nation. And we sit on this corner. And we come to church and we sing and we have a good time and we hear a word. They build prisons based on those statistics that I just gave you. It's a growth industry. I look at fourth grade reading levels. I see that there's 60% of the children that can't read at fourth grade reading levels. And I go build prisons for those kids today. What are we doing? What will our legacy be? We've had a vision on the walls of RCF for at least 13 years that I've been here. A vision that will supply jobs. A vision that will get us all united to do what we need to do as a body of Christ. Not black, not white, but I'm, I'm raising up black issues because I'm black. We need everybody to help. But see, the well to me is just a metaphor for church. When he's digging wells, everybody had to come to the well to get water, to water their cattle, to water, get water for themselves. It was the lifeblood. That's what the well symbolizes. And I believe that's what the church should symbolize. That we get together, we put away our differences and you when you walk in here you're not Republican or Democrat you're a Christian that wants the right things for the right time in our communities we need to get together and talk about things that's what they told me that happened in the 
old church. It was a gathering spot to make sure economics and to make sure children could read and to do all those things. We got a library sitting in the back. I just told you that Aurora is on the list, top three of illiterate cities. What will your legacy be? Are we just going to continue to come week after week, sit in the pews, and hope somebody else does something? Or are we going to be challenged? See, I'm angry. I'm angry. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm angry. I'm angry. That's why I got to change my weight situation and become obedient. I'm not AK angry. I ain't going to shoot nobody. Okay? But I, I, I'm, I'm Jesus in the temple angry, t- jumping over some tables, saying, why did the money changers start uh, uh, charging absorptive rates for people that were coming to Passover? That's the kind of angry I am. I'm kind of Rosa Park angry. I just got tired one day and didn't want to release my seat. That's the kind of anger I have. It's positive because I need to do positive change. And if I stay the same and I continue to tolerate this, I will never change it. So I'm angry today in a good way. In a good way. I love all of y'all. I see you most times in the parking lot. And I hug everybody. Don't take my message out of context. We got problems in this world. I believe the church is the solution to those problems. But we got to become a family. We got to know each other's name. We got to begin to say, hey, there are problems here. What can I do? Lord, take me. Guys, it can't just be about singing and getting a good word and we leave and we do nothing else. Come on, worship team. We got to be able to uh, understand where we are, guys. This is what God has put on my heart today. Personal leadership. It starts with me. Revival starts with me. He says, I, if you would just humble yourself and pray and seek my face, I will heal your land. This is what I did, not calling myself perfect. I had to make changes. I have a daily reading plan now that I check off to make sure that I'm reading the word every single day. And if I miss, I double up because I need to hear from God more. I need to hear from him more. I can't take it for granted. I'm raising two boys. I go to practice with them. I see other boys that may not have a father in the home. And when I begin to look at statistics get statistics and understand that there's 2.3 million African American men in prison. In prison. More than more than 1850 when we were in slavery. It's a problem. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? All people. Because it will affect everyone. I'm reading a book up here and I'll be done. It's called The Second Machine Age. Because also in those statistics, and I'm hitting hard at the end. The Nielsen ratings show that black families watch 70 hours worth of TV a week. That is two more hours than any other group of people. And we're watching reality shows and scandal. 
and we must hate our own lives. This book right here, The Second Machine Age, talks about two-thirds, two-thirds of swivel chair jobs would be gone by the year 2025. Two-thirds, 67 percent will be gone by the year 2025. And I'm not being alarmist. I'm not saying run out and do this or do that. I'm saying there's a problem. And if our kids can't read at the fourth grade level, how are they going to program a robot that's taking a job? All kids. I've turned up my reading habits. I've turned off the TV. There's things in books that we can do if we would just open them. I love you guys.